references to other structures. Next question. Uh, I want to know two or three points of yeah. this uh, speech. To be very clear, parts of uh, malware to uh, the control software to energy systems are founded in the hardware of the manufacturer. So these malware will be bring out with, with the new static. So that is one of the points uh, that attacks are possible. The second, we have there studies that in uh, metropolitan areas, so-called in your balance center, it means the Ruhrgebiet with 18 million inhabitants, you will have civil unrest within 1.5 days if you have a blackout. Then the civil society breaks together. And um, the third point, third one, third one, third one. Um, <laughs> I forget it. I'm okay, maybe it, it maybe comes up right. again. Uh, yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> let, let me answer the, before. The, the, governmental, the sure. governmental rule, forget yeah. it. Because I had it in Duisburg, I've, I ask, okay, we make all the telephony and so voice over IP. You know, if you have no internet, voice over IP is dead directly. And they say, no, because we have five fire um, fighting stations and they will do all this uh, civil stuff. I say, yes, 500,000 inhabitants and no plan B. So, and that is the state complete in Germany, I fear. So, you have to help yourself if it passes. Uh, yes, we have to help help ourselves because no organization, even if they have all resources, uh, won't be able to help millions of people. That's uh, to the IP, voice over IP stuff, we saw it one year ago in Berlin, Köpenick. The landlines were off immediately. Um, then the other topic, uh, the expectation of escalation or civil unrest. Uh, if we don't speak about and prepare people, it could be. Uh, sometimes I have the fear that uh, emergency service have to a bad expectation because there are also studies which say we should also expect more work together, but it depends also on the preparation again. Uh, but there will be a tipping point and the most important is to shift the tipping point away and this is mainly about the preparations. Uh, so on the first question, also the malware, uh, I am a cyber security guy from my background. I'm a career officer of the Austrian Armed Forces where I've been until 2012 in the cyber security section. And I'm telling always, uh, we should not fear only attacks. We should also fear complexity. And we have seen this already 2013 in Austria a uh, tricket from Germany, uh, a wrong uh, telegram, uh, brought the whole energy system in a very critical situation. We had luck, it was at the right time. Two years later, we would have been gone. Uh, but it raised attention and awareness of the cyber security, but it was no in, uh, attack, it was by incident. And I think this is more dangerous than the attack itself, because uh, this will be the last step. And also we saw already examples where uh, the um, uh, aufklärung, the preparation of uh, uh, cyber attack uh, leaded to a complete collapse of a uh, um, production site, and it was not intended. So it could be triggered by chance. Uh, thank you for the hints. So my first question is, but uh, before I start with the questions, uh, it's better for me and you, are, uh, you come from Austria, so we are can talking in German language, so it's much more easier for me and from you. maybe <laughs> for you too. Uh, also herzlichen Dank für die Informationen. Erste Frage, sind Sie der Autor des Romans Blackout? Zweitens, wenn Sie es nicht sind, haben Sie ihn gelesen, weil ich sehe also praktisch eine 100% Deckungsgleichheit Ihrer Informationen mit dem Roman. 
in dem Roman wurden die Smart, äh, was weiß ich, ich bin kein Techniker in dem Sinn, äh, Smart Meter. Komponenten eingebaut, die ja. also Angriffsflächen bieten. Was halten Sie davon? Also wie nah ist eigentlich der Roman, der das alles so beschreibt, an den wirklichen Realitäten dran? Ja. Wo, ich habe noch nicht gefunden, auch für die Politik, äh, also den Key, wie lösen wir das, außer, dass ich mir Gedanken gemacht habe, nämlich äh, in der Zukunft müssen wir einfach auf kleinere Einheiten ausweichen. Ja. Nämlich was was ich, ein Wohnblock hat halt sein eigenes Kraftwerk. Wie das aussieht, ob Diesel oder weiß der Geier was, äh, will ich jetzt gar nicht hinterfragen. Aber, oder wo stecken noch Potenziale, äh, um diesem Super-GAU, ob er jetzt peripher einzelne Branchen betrifft oder nicht, oder der globale Blackout, denn die anderthalb Tage, all das wird ja in diesem schönen Roman beschrieben, der Roman zählt ja runter von sieben bis einem Tag und nach zwei Tagen ist ja da schon das Chaos, wenn man ja nur, wie Sie es nett dargestellt haben mit der Toilette, weil es wird ja alles elektrisch betrieben, äh, auch die Toiletten, Spülungen, äh, ja, da sind wir ja im Morast schon morgen, und da die Politik also das Thema nicht anschneidet, äh, Sie stehen heute hier auf der Bühne, aber wie schaffen Sie und wir es, hier eine Sensibilisierung herbeizuführen, dass man sich mit dem Thema wirklich auseinandersetzt? Denn wenn es passiert, ja, dann ist es spät. Danke. First of all, I'm not Mark Ellsberg, but he is a Viennese author and we know each other and we meet, and we meet from time to time. Uh, we did uh, researches at the same time. I finished my study work in January 2012. This book was published in March 2012. And since then we know each other, so we came to the same result. And we are also sure that the second week is too optimistic in this book. Everything else is realistic. Very realistic, but the second week is too optimistic. So if we are in the second week, of a power cut, we won't be able to come back. And it's not our own uh, experience. Uh, there is also the study from the German government, TAP Studie, uh, which stated uh, after one week we have uh, heavy damages, many deaths, and it won't be easy to come back. So it's clear. Uh, Yes, <laughs> so it's everything public available. It's no secret, I tell you, you can find it since years. Uh, how can we do it? Uh, my experience is uh, it needs a bottom-up pressure because top-down it will need both, always both. But at the moment, they won't address it, uh, especially Germany, because the energy transition, you can't question. Uh, but it needs a different structure. But as you told, uh, it needs smaller uh, structures, but not only production, but also storage systems uh, and uh, possibility to produce also uh, if the net or the grid is off. Because most people don't know who have a PV system that their system will not produce any electricity during the grid is off. Yeah, the m m hardly anybody knows this, but now we have uh, techniques to make this possible, but at the moment uh, also these systems will not work. A and even more, it will be very hard to restart the whole system with this attached to the grid. So hopefully we will be able to do it during night hours. We don't know it. There's no experience. If I may ask, uh, my, my take home message was uh, that uh, just because something like that could happen, it's a good idea to have a food, water and some maybe gun. And <laughs> if it happens, then it's simply a start of post uh, However, I guess we as politicians should somehow try to prevent such a situation from happening, because obviously it is really hard to, to get back. 
So are there some sort of like assessments of uh, like overall the, the supply chains, like how they are interconnected? Is there someone actually like proactively mapping, simulating that, or should we kind of like introduce type of like assessment in order to do that? Uh, we have now technical possibilities we haven't had five years ago. So in Manich there is a data center where I don't know, I think 14, at least 14 grid, European grid operators uh, send their data uh, on real time and they are made permanent simulations to see if there are some areas where it could be, uh, where, where could uh, raise a problem to, to intervene at the right time. But what happens uh, if something goes wrong with the data? The one hand, and we had the situation, we had last year nine situations we haven't had before. Uh, and it showed up that the complexity is increasing. And one major incident was a wrong calculation of the pro production of PV. Uh, and it was a security breach between Switzerland and Germany. So yes, we do it, we can it, but there is no 100% security. A second incident was, it was mainly related to the market, uh, that Germany need had three gigawatt on reserve and needed eight gigawatt. It was possible because of the interconnections, the neighbor uh, countries were able to, to handle this, so we had luck again. But the situation at the moment is, uh, everybody says I am uh, decreasing my power plants, uh, and everybody is expecting uh, it can import from the neighbor countries. And until now, and now Germany is telling us also this way of development. And uh, then I'm saying interesting because until now, every time when it uh, uh, get to a, a shortage, every neighbor country was importing from Germany. So we had luck this winter because we had no cold wave. Otherwise, we would have maybe so already big troubles and also major cuts to prevent the blackout. So we had luck again. So I fear that the wrong decisions are made from it because everything went good, so there's no problem. And we will do it as long as it is functioning. But we have hardly any reserves anymore. Okay, next question. No, okay. no here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read on a website, uh, yeah. I think it was named Gridwatch, um, that the renewable energies like solar and wind power actually increase the stability of the network. And they presented good reasoning and also many sources for that, because the main reasoning I think was that it can be switched on and off in very small increments very fast so is this wrong or because in your talk you said they increase the likelihood of a blackout uh, it's not that easy because if you look on the frequency you see yeah not not really on the one hand uh, less variation but peaks we haven't seen before so on the one hand yes it looks like they are increasing the stability and there the question is what is causality and what is correlation and also professors um, misunderstand correlation with causality and this is the dangerous thing I, I would say and the problem is as we have seen two weeks ago we had hardly any wind nor PV production so hardly any uh, renewable energy production and last week we have seen a lot. And it must be on all times at the same level, production and consumption, otherwise the system will collapse. So it's dangerous to say, to see only one aspect, that's, that's the problem. Okay, next one. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation as well. Uh, first answer to him is, um, well, if you cannot communicate, you cannot synchronize. So all, you know, having all the PV and all the wind power energy systems basically not being able to synchronize them, it doesn't help you if you can switch them on and off and synchronize them at other times. My point to the whole thing is, and this will lead to the question, is that we had plans up to 30 years ago in Germany, very good, very precise plans what to do. We didn't have the level of communication we're having today, but we had the plans, and the plans were down to the smallest segments, basically down to the community and to the region, or as we call it, to the smallest um, administration districts, where plans were in written form available for all forces, military, police, fire brigade, uh, emergency services, and so on, and hospitals, how to work un under such circumstances. It was annually, it was exercises were held, basically, to figure out how to do it. It was from top down and from bottom up, how it was trained. Now, once the war was over, the Cold War was Come over, <laughs> yeah, just, just building up awareness, you know, because yeah. in the background we have, the question is, and precisely, um, do you s have an Austria, or do you know any European country that has a concept, a security concept on how to handle this if communication and power supply grids crash out? At the moment, I, at the moment, I don't know any country which would uh, have the preparations. Uh, South Tyrol uh, is increasing this more and more, as I learned just a few weeks ago. And I think also in Austria, they have started last year many um, activation was in the communities to raise awareness and to prepare for such an event but we are still not far enough to handle such an event at the moment and that the difference to 30 years ago is everything today is interconnected and everything needs each other otherwise the whole system is not functioning and at that time it was much easier because you don't ha have had this have the dependencies to the whole system. Huh? Okay, thank you. I know there's still some questions, but time is running up. The next speaker is here. I would ask you to make a short use the break to talk directly. Thank you very much. That's most inspiring. So five minutes break. It was set up for the last speaker for today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Prima, danke schön. <lacht> danke. Das verwenden. Schauen wir mal. Ja, denke ich, oder? Bin ich verwackelt? Das machen wir doch mal. Ja. 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 Der ist heller. Der ist heller. Ja, ist auch mal Schatten. <lacht> so, komm schon, dann machen wir das einfach so. Mit. Ich gehe mal um, irgendwas. Da, ja. Merkt keiner? Ja. Sehr gut. Ja. Ja, jetzt kann man sogar sehen. Das könnte was werden. Ich habe noch zwei Ergänzungen, die ich eigentlich sagen wollte. Aber das können eh was zu wenig Zeit dann. Das Bundesamt für Bevölkerungsschutz Katastrophenhilfe hat Checklisten vorbereitet. So, was sollte man kaufen, was sollte man da haben, wie lange. Ne? Ja. Sehr, sehr gut. Die kann man empfehlen. Ja. Natürlich, der Pandemie gibt es eine sehr bestürzende Studie der Bundesregierung, der Deutschen 2012 Bundes auch, ja. Ja, das das ist 2013. Ist die tatsächlich von einem modifizierten SARS ausgehen, nämlich auch Corona nennen. Ich habe es nicht gelesen, ich habe es mal ich habe es mal kopiert. Ja, 10% Bruttoinlandsprodukt runter, 7,5 Millionen Tote, 8 bis 10 Monate, keine Gesundheitsversorgung, wie wir sie kennen oder gewohnt sind. Äh, Supply Chain, Effekte, die man nicht berechnen kann. Und, äh, 
Zusammenbruch äh, der Wörter. So, ungefähr, das ist so. Und ähm, die machen wir nicht. Von Deutschland, von Sarah von Jürgen.
Well, please come back to your seats. We will proceed now with the last panel for today. Husch, husch, auf die Plätze. So, this is our last speaker for today. It's Dr. Konstantinos Tsetsos. He's a research assistant and a professor of international politics and a managing director of Secure Risk. He will be talking about Know Thy Risk, approaches to political risk analysis in a dynamic world. Stage is yours. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, maybe to, to, to bridge uh, for my four speakers, uh, to my four speakers presentation. Uh, I'm also currently the project manager of a uh, European Union project uh, dealing with common operational picture in crisis and disaster management where we try to, to bridge civilian and military uh, first responders in times of crisis. Not necessarily only blackout, it could be a flood, it could be a wildfire, um, but there is a, as you can see, in, in the, as a political scientist, there are a multitude of topics that you can uh, um, excel at and dwell upon. Today we're gonna look at political risk analysis and the purpose of my presentation is mostly directing uh, towards how scientific uh, findings or research results can be bridged into the uh, political domain and the business domain uh, in the uh, field of uh, security. Now, um, when you do political risk analysis, there's like always in science, uh, the first question you have to answer is uh, which level of analysis uh, are you actually aiming at? Uh, if you have a, um, uh, a question that deals with big global developments and trends, then you are uh, logically situated on the macro level. One example could have been, for instance, democratic develop demographic developments of humanity in the next 50 years. So you have a global perspective, a global picture you look at. Um, if you dwell into regional questions, let's say how will uh, economy develop in uh, North Africa, um, uh, you are on a meso level where you look at the country on a national level or a region, a group of countries, but not on a, on a global scope. And then of course the micro level is um, looking into the black box, which is the nation state uh, or a specific region uh, down to, if possible, uh, um, square meters, uh, where you look at detailed events and sh short term changes and try to monitor those for the purpose of security risk evaluation. Now, Again, in science, always the question determines which method and which type of data you should be using. Uh, if you use structural data, then because they are originate usually from international organizations um, or on a yearly level, uh, you could uh, uh, utilize them only for questions that have a macroscopic perspective most of the time. Um, examples could be, for instance, uh, developments in the regime type or political system of a country such as uh, democratization levels. Uh, political governmental stability, GDP per capita growth rates uh, or decline, um, literacy, et cetera, et cetera. On a national level, you could also, depending on the development state of the country, you are sometimes lucky, you even get it for sub-regional uh, or sub-national levels such as uh, provinces or the German equivalent would be Bundesland. And then you can make uh, comparisons uh, of changes and differences and trends within a specific nation state. Um, here's one example, for instance, uh, China uh, data from the year 2018, uh, the GDP per capita uh, divided by, uh, or shown in, uh, on a subnational level, uh, and then of course uh, one evaluation would be that of course the economic epicenter of uh, uh, China uh, is the coastal areas, where, uh, and you can see gross differences between the um, less populated and more with more harsh environmental conditions um, in the west than the eastern uh, um, coastal area where the megapolis, of course, are located. The next uh, type of data that you can look at is so-called event data. What is event data? In a nutshell, it's looking at who did what to whom, when, at what time. Could be everything, uh, communication interaction uh, and... and um, uh, uh, investment strategy or investment, uh, uh, a current one or a, a bomb attack. So uh, local event data that can be geo-referenced to a specific spot 
uh, giving you information about one single event that is of some sort of political nature. It can be, as I said, everything, uh, political, uh, political, economical, ecological, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, what we do there is basically we look at uh, a lot of universities are engaging in this field. Some examples, uh, uh, because I, of course, concentrate on security politics, we, the examples here only show you um, conflict-related databases. Um, some are uh, well-known, like uh, um, ACLED, so Armed Conflict Location Event Database, or uh, Global Database on Events Location and Tone, GDELT, uh, but there are many others. Um, that could be a valuable source, so daily, weekly, sometimes hourly, uh, you get um, uh, uh, data points for events that are currently happening, occurring around the, the globe, with different uh, degrees of quality, of course, because let's say, um, uh, take an example for GDELT, uh, <coughs> uh, you have, of course, a different penetration level in a highly digitalized section of the global, uh, uh, global community than you have, let's say, in the Sahel area or uh, Western China. Uh, mm. Plus, most of them are concentrated in, on English language, so the more uh, you have English speakers, the more is produced. So this noise has to be taken into consideration whether or not you evaluate. It doesn't mean that there is more violence going on in New York. Uh, it's just that more people are discussing maybe one and the same event over and over again. So you have to clean this out. You can augment that with social media if you want. Personally, I'm not a fan of that, but it, it can be done. So Twitter feeds, Facebook posts, Instagram, you name it. Um, and these examples are a mixture, show a mixture. Some databases are fully uh, automated. Uh, um, some are manual coded, so they are actually already run through a, a, a evaluation process by the scientists that are involved there. So usually the quality there is much higher because they eliminate uh, the doubles, they uh, um, uh, geo-reference it much more correct than an automation uh, could do. Um, and then depending on which one you use or a mixture of, you, should, you have to always to analyze the code book how a single event is actually categorized uh, based on the method these scientists use. Um, another option would be, and I'm gonna show you a demonstrator later, is to uh, actually scrape the data yourself. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, um, uh, create a, a huge uh, pool of potential sources which you want to monitor on a daily, hourly, uh, if you want five minute basis, and then uh, um, categorize them behind a schematic, a code book, uh, have the algorithm georeference them as good as possible. Of course, there are uh, false positives there, both in the events and, and also the location. Um, you, you don't believe how many Librevilles there are in Africa <laughs> and taught, uh, teaching an algorithm that there are m more than one Libreville, uh, even within the same country, is, is quite a, a tough thing to do. Um, so it's not a perfect world, but it's uh, helping you. It's a very good tool in your toolbox, accumulating real-time data about political interactions in any domain. In this case, where we're looking at security. Good. Why do you do that? Well, because if you look at the uh, security industry around the world, um, or if you go to the foreign ministry uh, pages of every uh, country in this world, you're gonna get something like travel uh, risk announcements, uh, like do not go to Nigeria or do not go to Iraq because it's dangerous. Yeah? Or the government says, uh, doesn't recommend unless it's necessary to go there. Now, here's one example to highlight uh, to you or show you why it is important to look not on a national level, but on a sub-national level, and even if possible on a uh, sub-regional sub, uh, level. So um, what we have here is all the uh, uh, conflict fatalities of the year 2016 um, for Nigeria. Conflict fatalities are uh, coded as uh, uh, non-governmental, governmental, governmental uh, military interaction with, uh, that lead to uh, fatalities. And we get the number that is 1,585 for the total of uh, Nigeria, you can see that uh, they're coded in the multiplicity of uh, 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 different, other, uh, different other events are also coded, so how many, uh, who won the battle, uh, what exactly happened, uh, is it a violent process, a protest, is it a non-violent protest, and so on and so forth. But the final number shows us the fatalities. Now, if I concentrate only on the region of Borno where Boko Haram is very active, I can see that about 80% of all the fatalities are located in this region, which means that if I'm a traveler or an investor 
or I want to, uh, to attend a conference in the city of Lagos, probably I shouldn't be that much afraid of uh, security developments that originate from Boko Haram. I would probably should be more uh, uh, afraid uh, about normal crime levels, petty crime or whatever, but not terrorism. So what, what does here is basically putting everything into context, the perception into a right uh, point of view, um, because if you, let's say, accumulate information only on the basis of mass media, then you sometimes get a distorted picture of what's actually going on where in the world. Uh, looking behind the curtain sometimes reveals that, okay, the country has uh, security challenges that it's facing. Yes, there is conflict going on, but it's confined to a certain uh, area only. That doesn't mean that I cannot go to Port Hakur or Lagos. It does also doesn't mean that Port Hakur or Lagos are secure, yeah, because probably in Port Hakur, which is... Uh, 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 I have another problem called piracy. <laughs> yeah, so I shouldn't uh, go around there in my yacht fishing or something. Uh, probably not going to end well. But that would mean that I would have to prepare differently for this particular security challenge. So that's the benefit of looking. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, on a mi micro level, uh, event data is much more uh, useful than uh, structural data. Good. What else does it allow me? Um, we cannot uh, compare and cross-check it with event data from uh, neighboring regions where I can see whether or not there are spillover effects for this particular uh, region. Um, the algorithm can tell me the main actor by natural language processing, reading basically this all open source in intelligence, sorry, I didn't mention that before, so it's just newspapers reporting about single political events on a daily basis. Yeah, you can rate them by quality if you want, that should be done manually, uh, but um, you can have the algorithm check out which is the main actor, so who did what to whom? Is it the police, is it this political party or that political party, this uh, uh, mastermind or whatever? And based on the um, categorizations, you get, of course, interaction networks. So you can see which actor is more active than another actor in a specific time. Over time, of course, what you then can get is some sort of a glimpse into uh, conflict developments, when, uh, where they intensified uh, 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 times of this particular conflict, uh, and maybe if even which event originated to a more uh, conflict regulation, reconciliation, or intensification. So, in a nutshell, why do we have to look sub-state, and as depicted here, even sub-sub-state? Uh, it's because we want to get a better picture of what's actually going on somewhere. Um, whether it is for your investment, whether it is for your travel, security, whether it is just for you as a, as a political risk analyst want to understand what's going on in this particular country and, and who's responsible for violence or any other variable you look at. Um, what you can see here is basically a depiction on a, the equivalent would be Landkreis uh, in Germany where conflict fatalities were recorded in the year 2014. You can see the epicenters, of course, um, in the north um, east and in the center where the, the uh, capital is. Ironically, that's actually also the dividing line between Christian and Muslim populations, so there is, of course, a reason for that. Um, but if I change the variable yeah, uh, and look at a different phenomena, um, social unrest or protests or riots, without conflict fatalities, the epicenters, of course, are completely uh, uh, different. They are located in the population centers in the south and in the capital. So just by changing the variable, of course, you come up with different results. Uh, could mean that both areas are dangerous during times of, uh, I mean, the North is dangerous due to terrorism or, or conflict events. The South is dangerous, in particular, during times of demonstrations. You shouldn't hang out at the main squares of these particular <laughs> cities. And the last thing it allows you to do is, of course, to uh, look at spatial and temporal dependencies. For, um, it's similar to the trend analysis. Uh, you can see whether or not uh, the conflicts intensify, if they expand, if spillovers are created, and so on and so forth. As you can see, so far we have only just looked at monitoring and we will continue to, to look only at monitoring until the very last step. Uh, how do we do it? I mentioned it already. <clears throat> Everything is open source data. It's either uh, you get scraped data from someone else in a raw form or you get it already coded uh, or you can code it yourself. If you code it yourself, you need, of course, a coding scheme. You need to train your data set. You need to classify uh, the events. You employ machine learning. Uh, and then you de deduct features uh, from which then you can start model if you actually want to look beyond monitoring, which would be uh, um, 
creating valid as valid as possible predictions for the near future. Yeah, so as you can see here, uh, the algorithm will probably look at who's doing what, where, to whom. Uh, here, uh, it's a boarding event by pirates uh, somewhere off the coast of Nigeria. Good. Then, of course, the classical uh, political scientist works, work come in, here depicted in, uh, um, for, for Libya. This is old, of course, it's not the current political actor uh, situation uh, where, but I mean, elements are still valid, uh, where you look at the main governments, who supports them, which militias are behind them, at least uh, the ones you're sure, sure about, what other actors are there and what the relationship between those actors are. Uh, um, in a nutshell, the general uh, situation in Libya, I mean, emphasis have shifted, but in reality, we still have some sort of three governments. Uh, back in the day, this was the original government, which is now Haftar. Nowadays, it's the um, government of national accor accord. Uh, probably, uh, so this line now would have to be dark because they are in conflict. Back then, they were still cooperating. And this is the uh, former uh, Tripoli-based government. Al-Qaeda is still uh, present in the AS. They were usually back in Seattle, but now uh, they're more to the south towards the border uh, with um, neighboring countries into the Sahel. Yeah, so putting it to a test, like I sh showed with Nigeria, uh, here for 2018, all the uh, conflict-related uh, uh, fatalities in uh, Libya, um, the region color indicates the maximum total amount of fatalities. Red dots indicate where the uh, most single events were recorded. So the larger the dot, the more conflict events occurred there. Uh, the darker the color behind the scheme, uh, it is um, uh, the, the more fatalities happen in the particular uh, administrative region. Now, this is from 2018, so it's uh, uh, outdated, of course. Nowadays, uh, most of the battles concentrate around Tripoli and around the oil uh, uh, producing terminals at the northern coast. Good. Uh, same story, uh, different year. Uh, social protests were, uh, again, concentrate on your population areas. Interestingly, for us here would be, why Zabar, what's happening in Zabar, that they have so many uh, social unrest going on, even though it's not necessarily in the epicenter of military interaction. Yeah. Good. Now a more detailed one, uh, instead of uh, you know, creating multiple maps, uh, we are creating um, an overview map here. Uh, it's for the whole year of uh, um, uh, conflict events in Pakistan. And you can see from the different color indication uh, and the different shape uh, where which type of event was located. Of course, we have a very big eagle's view here. Uh, uh, and you see that the majority of events were protests and riots, not necessarily with the result of fatalities, uh, whereas uh, battles in remote violence, such as terrorism or police raids, police operations that resulted in fatalities are, are the red ones. And those, the specific one, it's when a non-governmental actor actually creates uh, civilian fatalities. Yeah, so um, shootings or, uh, and, and ev ev everything we see at here is not crime, right? It has to be uh, a political organization over a sustainable amount of time uh, projecting violence into elements of society for whatever political reason, not for monetary reasons. If it's monetary, then we would uh, um, distinguish it uh, more into crime. Yeah? So um, that's why, for instance, we are, let's say political science has problems with the conflict in Mexico uh, because it's organized crime that has reached a degree of intensification that would actually qualify as war. Yeah? The classical definition of war in political science is 1,000 battle-related deaths. Battle-related would mean 1,000 dead soldiers. Now, since war has uh, transformed, we have transformed also the definition, so it's 1,000 conflict-related deaths, including civilians, not just military personnel. Uh, there's still a high degree of intensity. You reach that in Mexico in the last 15 years. So, but is it a war, yeah? Um, this is a, a, an issue of debate. Usually it's much more clear-cut. It's a political organization that want to uh, regime change, that want protection of minority rights, uh, that have other ideologies, yeah, that's much more clear cut than a cartel telling the government, 
this in, this suburb is mine, and if you ever enter, uh, I'm gonna shoot you, <laughs> yeah? And everyone that cooperates will also be shot. We are not sure whether or not we should actually classify this as war. Even though, let's say, in common tongue, we would say war on drugs, war on uh, whatever, uh, obesity. Uh, it's not war from a scientific point of view. And now we take out the microscope and look at, uh, as I said, in some cases, the information is so accurate, like I have a news report from the Tripoli Times. It tells me at the corner of uh, Surabaya uh, Mohammed Square, uh, one guy uh, uh, did a suicide attack with 12 fatalities uh, in the, at a bus station. And then, of course, I can, we can georeference it exactly. If we can't, then it will only be shown on the next aggregation level, which would be probably region or, or um, the state. But here, for instance, if, if, if you, you call me and ask me, I'm in a hotel in the old city, what happened the last two weeks uh, there? Uh, anything terror related I should be uh, aware of, or I'm taking this route to, to the airport. Uh, is there a better one? The question with better is always, uh, look, you can only map pa the past. We, we can try to predict the future, but not on this level. We can map the past on this level, yes. The past might also be just yesterday. Uh, and that will give you some sort of information on how to proceed. But if you, with risk, it's like this. If you, you can never get rid of it, but if you minimize it by 1%, it's worth the effort. Yeah, and uh, governments and industry are responsible for their employees and they have to take any measure necessary. And the, the best measure of prevention is actually training and education. Uh, like how do I have to uh, present myself to locals and so on and so forth? How do I interact? How do I react in this and this situation? And oh, by all those measures, you can reduce it to a manageable level, I would say. Um, and uh, the, still, uh, the risk still remains, but it becomes much more uh, treatable. Yeah? Um, here would then be the uh, certain events. So I highlighted some uh, gunmen took control of the bank. So you shouldn't go use the ATM machine there. Uh, three gold merchants abducted or a militia started controlling uh, a military uh, base or naval base from another uh, uh, militia. Uh, and here, the similar thing for Karachi just highlighted with where the location of the most uh, uh, hotels that are used by foreigners are um, in comparison to the airport, which is one is here and there's another one over there. So. Uh, as you see, the, the events themselves are now much more, uh, um, uh, they are different categories, not just violence, uh, much more accurate. And you could uh, highlight certain areas where um, it's considered safe because let's say the local government takes measures to protect uh, businessmen and civilians much more by much more checkpoints, much more police uh, being present. Yeah, still something can happen, but uh, let's say hanging out here is, is safer. You all know this famous pictures of uh, Rio, where you can be in a five-star hotel and you take just the wrong corner and then you are in the middle of a favela. Uh, this is something you should be aware of when you are in, let's say, sort of critical areas. It's not that all the world is bad and, and uh, or insecure and only Europe and the, uh, and the US are safe, uh, but you should have situational awareness of, of, of where you're at. Um, so you shouldn't wonder then why you are hijacked <laughs> or kidnapped. Yeah? Good. Uh, now, just to show you some demonstrators. Uh, let's see if hotspot's still on. Um, how you can put this into action before I release you of boring methodology. Uh, what we did here, oh, hotspot. Yep. Um, whoop. So these are the events we categorized. It's uh, uh, traffic, theft, uh, violence, narcotics, and so on and so forth. Uh, for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Whoop. And now it's not the fastest internet connection. Thank you, Germany 2020, LTE. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the thing. It might not be the safest continent, but in Africa, guys, um, <laughs> LTE actually means LTE, yeah, uh, of 4G actually means 4G. Uh, okay, good. So we're gonna give it a minute. Might maybe lock out and in. No. Hmm. And it shows full bars. Can I lock in here on the local network? Yeah. Yes, uh, sure. Is it good? So please uh, give us the password. Stream the password. That's the best thing. 
Ah, okay, right. Good. Uh, and which one? Event true? Yes. Okay, wait. I think now it works. I think. Uh, there we are. Okay, it works now. Telecom decided. Okay. Uh, uh, it's worth uh, giving us a service after we pay so much. Good, so <laughs> what we see here, uh, again, it's just a demonstrator, don't expect too much. Uh, what you see is all the crimes reported from February 12th till, till uh, today for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland by the official authorities, so press reports that are released by the police. Uh, our data goes back to 2012, uh, or 13, sorry. So I can use the time scale and go back years, but if I do that, you know what Telecom's gonna do with us. Um, so uh, just for you to highlight that, you know, you can employ this on actually anything, yeah? Uh, any IT innovation, uh, whatever. If you want to visualize any development, uh, you can do it here, and then we see uh, what's in, going on in Munich right now. Okay, and there you see wrong geocode. Thank you. Uh, presentation effect. Okay, so here Mr. Rumpel has gone missing. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, you can translate that if you want on the next. I mean, we haven't employed it, but we're just on the test server with this, where you can, I mean, after fixing geocode, of course, much better, uh, you can translate it in an actual crime development on a monthly basis, like crimes against industry, crimes against houses, crimes against uh, uh, um, whatever. Uh, uh, thefts going up, down 20%, and you cross-reference that with, just a second, with the uh, BKR uh, data that you can select then for multiple uh, incidents. So I can assure you uh, theft level in Munich is relatively low. Let's see where you shouldn't argue with someone. So in Bremen, I wouldn't argue with someone on the street because <laughs> in 67% of the cases, it uh, leads into a fatality. Now, the same thing I, I highlighted you earlier. Uh, in these categories, what we're seeing here, this is much more uh, sophisticated, uh, is economy, uh, politics, crime, infrastructure, Islamic terror, violence, and naval piracy. We prepare this for German ship owners that are actually engaged in all those major harbors. So what we actually see is all the terminal uh, harbors uh, in Africa and Asia that can deal with containers. Um, in this categories, this is already filtered. So from the six, 50 to 60,000 news that were uh, produced from February 3rd to uh, 10th, uh, we update every Tuesday. Uh, it's already pre-filtered with, uh, uh, so that only 8,000 remain. And, but that's still too much for the human brain to process. So with the customer, we developed some sort of a, a scheme, which is the most relevant one, and then you can uh, zoom in and look, let's say, what's going on in Mogadishu, uh, and can see that Uganda is going to withdraw its troops, two government soldiers killed, and so on and so forth. If you want the original news behind it, it's always uh, linked. Um, and this is how we basically would do on a daily basis monitoring of a specific region. If you do this for months and years, you can advance to the next level, uh, which is then actually going into predictive analytics, uh, employing machine learning to predict the future as much as possible, ignore the dates up here, that's the only thing that doesn't update. Uh, so actually what we're seeing now is the prediction that 25 people are going to die on the sub-state national level from a government, non-government interaction the next three months. Um, and you can see, of course, the epicenters we all know, so it's Yemen, parts of Syria, parts of Iraq, parts of Afghanistan, uh, the part of Pakistan. Uh, then here, back here we had the Rohingya. They are now currently pacified, communist rebels and Moro rebels, and Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines. And then uh, whoop, you can look at the uh, historic data on the back left, and the percentage we actually get there, which is not an accurate depiction, but it's the... Uh, probability of how likely the prediction is correct. 
Yeah? Uh, since we do it since 2014, we can uh, validate our data back, uh, of course, and compare the former prognosis with, the, with the, what actually happened, and we are at about 80, 82 to 84%. So the, the longer we train it, we hope we're gonna reach 90. Everything beyond 90 is Star Trek, yeah? Uh, but it's enough to show you where you shouldn't go or invest or if you want to know what's going to happen. So basically you see the likelihood of you seeing something like a, a conflict onset uh, starting in its nascency uh, with approaches like this is very high. So you could, you know, see an, usually you see an intensification of violence uh, on a local level that would then spread into total war. Yeah, for this region or even interstate. Um, what this does is it highlights you, oh, something's going on there, and then you have to go in as an expert and evaluate what is actually going on there. Is it, is it just over-reporting by the algorithm, or uh, is someone uh, um, you know, uh, feeding you wrong information? Um, uh, um, or is it actually going to you know, lead to a crisis that we're gonna read about in the newspapers in two months from now? Yeah? One example for all those that maybe uh, windsurfing in uh, <laughs> uh, Egypt. Uh, if you go to Hugada, every, Hugada, everything is safe. You shouldn't go into the north of Sinai uh, because there are probably 50 bodies produced every month there, mostly Islamic terrorists. Yeah? All right, thanks for uh, uh, having me. I think we can now go into questions. And I hope I could give you a good glance on how we or how scientists try to, you know, take what they, the boring stuff they do in, in the university and project it into more hands-on practical problems. All right, thank you. We've tried both. Automatically, usually, I mean, they produce something, and it's the more time you invest, the better it gets. Uh, my personal opinion is manual is better. But um, I'll tell you how we do it. Sometimes we have 20, 30 students. Uh, we give them uh, a, sh a short salary, and then we have them. I mean, we train them, of course, and then we have them. Because then you don't get that many false positives. Uh, and I don't think, I mean, I'm not an expert, I'm a political scientist, my colleague's actually uh, uh, doing the algorithm. Um, I can only superficially tell you about the, uh, the approaches he used, uh, since it's not my, my field. Look, because data science, the way we do it is actually we try to marry my domain, political science, security politics, with informatics or computer science. Because like big companies, IBM, yeah, or Microsoft, or Google, they're very good here. They're super shitty here. They don't, uh, they don't tell you that, but that's the reality. Universities are usually super good here and very shitty here, unless they are uh, the correct faculty. Uh, but they lack, you know, a, a programmer will never tell you which variable is relevant other than what the, what, what the formula will tell them. A political scientist will tell you, well, because we're in Somalia, this is much more important because in the last 30 years that was very important. For instance, I don't know, tribalism. Let's, let's use this variable and quantify this. Let's see what's come out, coming out. So, our approach or philosophy is marry the two domains, go back into universal science as it used to be, and do not differentiate between social sciences classic and, and natural sciences classic, and they don't interact. That's, I think, not the best way to do it. Currently, my diagnosis would be, unfortunately, that's what we do. Yeah? Uh, and in order to get good quality, to answer your question again, I believe manual is better, but we don't have the time to you know, go through one million data points. That's why we look for automation. <laughs> yeah? accepting the loss in, in quality. Uh, we're currently working on a solution to offer it uh, as API. I mean, the data we uh, accumulate is open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and after our processing, you would ask for that. Yeah, we're currently working on uh, some solution to offer it through API because most of the governments out there or, or businesses, they already have systems. Some do, some don't. And um, you know, you can't sell them another solution. Uh, so it's rather go through API, so pro be a data provider. Um, look, we are all into open data, but there are of course problems. Sometimes we have to pay for data. 
uh, sometimes uh, universities offer them for free, but for no commercial use. So that's why we, we try and scrape ourselves. But even if I scrap the New York Times based on, on, on uh, legal, let's say, uh, uh, conditions, we are not quite sure if it's allowed, actually. Yeah? Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, currently no, to answer your question, but in the future, yes. Uh, that's our idea, and uh, as free as possible. All right. Thanks for having me. Enjoy. So, no, this was our last panel for today, for the first day of the Pirate Party Security Conference. We'll be having an evening event at 1900, so get together. If you're interested, we'll meet at a restaurant right around the corner. It's called Georgios der Grieche in the Impulse Street 47. And we'll see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you.